This morning, I'm going to ask you a question. Where is your hope? Where is your hope? This is going to be one of those interactive services and sermons where you're going to get opportunity to, to ask yourself some questions and even ask your neighbor a couple questions because a lot of times some of you all don't talk to yourself very much, so it's good to have somebody talk to you. So I'd like to, we're going to begin by you turn to your neighbor, look at them. It might be behind you, it might be in front of you, it might be across, but look at your neighbor and smile at them. Let them know that you, you're happy to see them. And you can say this, and tell, them, tell them this, you are so blessed. Now you got to tell them this, you are so blessed to be sitting by me. Yes, you are. Happy, happy. Um, anyway, some of you ain't saying nothing, but that's okay. I, I, appreciate, I appreciate what the Lord is, is encouraging, and I was speaking into your life along the lines of hope. Where is your hope? Where does your hope lie? Where do you find your hope? Now, of course, the obvious answer and the easy answer to that question is our hope is in the Lord. And that's what the psalmist said in chapter 33, the book of Psalms, chapter 33, verse 18. If you would just find yourself there real quick. Uh, Psalm 33, verse 18, he said, but the eyes of the Lord, this is verse 18. The chapter is 33. The book is Psalm. And he said, the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those who hope, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love. To deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. Keep them alive in persecution. Keep them alive in pandemics. To keep them alive. Not just physically alive. Now, how many of you know that God's purpose is to keep you spiritually alive? And not just barely alive, but keep you vibrant and exciting with passion to start moving mountains. And he said, that is those whose hope is in his unfailing love to deliver them from death and keep them alive and found. We wait, I like this, we wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and he is our shield. In him our heart rejoices for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love, verse 22, may your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. So that portion of Scripture is easy. And then we look at that and say, yeah, I find myself in that. How many would say? And here's, here's what I mean. I want you to look at this. If your hope is in the Lord, raise your hand. Okay. If it's in something else, we, in God, we trust. It's still on your money. That is a good place to put it. They were talking about that. They were wanting to change it to in the Pope we hope, but I'm hoping that you can keep with in God we trust. He is where our hope lies. And that is something that is always going to be intact. It is always going to be where your heart can find solace and strength and provision is in the midst and the provision of your God. And you would say amen. You raised your hands and said, my hope is in my Lord. That's who I hope in. Now, we also understand not only where your hope is found, but also this is a good barometer. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you some insight because if the, the absolute insight, the absolute knowledge of, well, I know, I know that's, I'm supposed to have hope in God, but I'm, I'm trying to have more hope in my God, and I know I should have absolute hope. All my hope is found in Him, all my trust, all my faith, all that needs to be forged and founded in Him, but there are some areas of my life that I'm not so sure, or I'm trying to get to the place where I know I need to be. Here's the barometer. He said, and, and uh, did you know your anxiety level, your fear level, your anxiety level is the barometer of your hope level? So wherever you have a fear, wherever you have an anxiety. And all of a sudden it got quiet. Eh, no more amens there. My anxiety level in an area of my life tells me 
of my hope level in that same area. Here's what I mean. If you need a little bit of better insight, and some of you are way ahead of me, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to connect with you here, and this is it. If you're afraid of something or if you have an anxiety about something and it is causing you some sleepless situations or it is causing you to be preoccupied with a circumstance or a situation, then your hope level is low in that area if your anxiety level is high. Does that make sense? I see some heads nodding a little bit. Okay. And I'm just trying to be real. I'm trying to be in the position where I am giving to you that insight, something that you can hang on to, something that is where the rubber meets the road, something that I am. And I appreciate when I read the Psalms, especially when David is having a hard time and David is going through and he's bouncing off the bottom and he's, he's depressed and he's telling you about it. He said, why are you downcast, oh my soul? He's, he's talking to himself. Soul, why are you having a hard time? Because he's having a hard time. I am glad that he's real about it instead of just pretending in this pretense that everything is well when it's not. Now we've got to be very careful. You want to bless and not curse. You want to speak life and not death. But in doing so, I also understand you need to recognize what's going on and do battle. Begin to intervene in situations and circumstances and move the mountain. By pretending the mountain's not there. Oftentimes, God did not place that mountain in front of you so you can bless it away. God put that mountain in front of you so you can do battle and become strength. Uh, the, the faith rises up and begin to do what he's given you to do to move those mountains, to speak to the angry waves. Now, with that being said, this insight, David is very clear on a number of issues when it comes to having a hard time. And so if we can honestly look at our life in some of these areas that we have a little bit of anxiety and recognize our hope needs to become a little stronger in some areas, you're in a good place. Here's why. If you never recognize you have a problem, I always enjoy somebody else that they're always, they always have situations, they always have drama, they always have, and it's everybody else's fault. You know anybody like that? There's nothing they ever did. It's always somebody else. Well, I'm mad at God and I'm mad at the church and it's somebody else's fault. Well, I don't really like this. I don't really, you know, this is a, this is a problem. This is an issue. And, and, they, and I'll, I'll, I'll promise you that individual and that circumstance in their life will always be intact. It will always grip them because they never come to the place where they begin to look introspectively and begin to see where I need help. How many of you with me would raise your hand and say, I need help. I am just a little bit messed up. Half a bubble off sometimes. You know what I'm saying? A whole fry short of a Happy Meal. <laughs> Need some help. I recognize that I have not arrived. I recognize that I'm a long ways away from being where the Lord needs me to be. And so with that being said, I look at some of the areas that there's some anxiety and there's some fear, knowing that I need some hope elevated. Because if I truly trust and my hope is in the Lord, in that area of my life, there should be no fear. There should be no fear. No anxiety. If there is, we're going to begin to look at how God will elevate and strengthen you in those areas and give you the help that you need. Isn't that great? Isn't that great? You come to church and they just the preacher doesn't tell you all your problems and then never gives you any hope and never gives you any help and just says, well, you're messed up. See ya. 
But here, I'm going to go to the Word, and we're going to look at some things and, and uh, understand how we can, we can begin to receive the strength. In Psalms 20, verse 7, Psalm 20, verse 7, some trust in chariots, others in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. My trust and my hope is none other than Jesus. You want to know why? It's because everything else has failed. Everything else outside of my God has failed me. And if I place my trust and my hope in someone other than Jesus, I'm going to be disappointed. Eventually, I'm going to be let down. Eventually, I'm going to be discouraged. But I trust in Jesus. I have great hope in my God and the authority and the power that comes through His Spirit. And the reason why, the reason why we have these trust issues, throw that up there, trust issues. I know that all you have always, or you've already arrived. You don't have any of these problems. None of you have any trust issues. Right? But perhaps you know somebody that has trust issues and you're going to help them by listening and writing some things down. So that you can, you take away from this sermon today and you can go back and say, hey, pastor gave me a great message and now I can help you finally. Amen. But for the rest of us that have, might have some trust issues, hey man, my trust issues have trust issues. And why do you have trust? Why, why is there situations, circumstances that you have these areas of your life in Proverbs 13, 12? Here's why. This is what is very clear. Solomon said this. He said, hope deferred makes the heart sick. But when the desire comes, it is a tree of life. But hope deferred makes the heart sick. Do you ever hope in something and really, really with anticipation or longing to see something come to pass? And you've been praying about, and it, this is probably the greatest arena of deferment of hope and where we really get disappointed is we were praying and we were asking God to do something very specific. We have a specific need. And we say, Jesus, we need your help. And I said, and he didn't answer the way you wanted him to. Oh, no. What happened is he decided to do it a different way. And it was totally outside of our wheelhouse. We didn't really see it coming. We didn't expect that. But God said, this is the way we're going to do it. And at the moment, it didn't feel right. It was, it was hard. It was difficult. At the moment that he answered, because God will always answer. How many know that? He will always, always answer. Every time he'll answer you. He'll answer with a yes. How many like the yes when he answers yes? Yeah. Yeah. Come on now. Yeah, I like the yes. You've been praying, God, I need a million dollars. He said, yes. Oh, yeah. By the way, he hasn't said yes to that yet, so I'm going <laughs> Then he'll answer, no. It's hard for us to hear no. But how many of you found when God says no to the very specific thing you've been asking for, God has something better? God's had his way is so much better than my way. His ways are higher than my ways. His thoughts are higher than my thoughts. And when he answers no, it's because he's bringing together something so much more of a blessing, not only to me, but to others. And he just has me in this holding pattern because he's fitting it all together. And he's, and one of the hardest things to do is have patience. I know many of you are just patient beyond belief, and I appreciate your patience. But there's others of us, maybe we're not so patient, and God, and we don't have to pray for patience. God knows what we need, and He's going to help you with it anyway. And so here it comes. Here comes patience, and He's working on you. And, uh, and, and in that waiting, in the patient times, He is putting together great things, very powerful things. The third way that He answers is wait a while, is it's coming. And He doesn't give you a yes, He doesn't give you a no, but He said that it's, it's, the answer is coming. And, and that 
It's the same arena of waiting. And God always comes through. I said, God always comes through. He always shows up. He always does what he said he's going to do. He always makes a way when there's no way. And in the provision of his grace and what he does for you, he has never failed. You might have looked at it and said, well, this doesn't, this doesn't look like it's a win. It doesn't look like a victory. That's what the disciples thought when Jesus was crucified. They looked at that and said, this is not what we had anticipated. This is not what we thought. We thought that Jesus was, as we were coming into Jerusalem just a week before, and the people were crying, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they were laying down their coats in front of him, and they were wearing, waving the branches, and they were crying out, He is King and Messiah. They were thinking, we're just going to stroll right up to the temple. He's going to make things right. He's going to go up to the palace, kick out that that uh, that, that uh, king that is so far from God, and he's going to set up his kingdom, and we're going to rule and we're going to reign together. And the fishermen were really getting excited because the only thing they were king over is king of the halibut. And that's it. But he had a different plan. They didn't see it, but you did. Someone say, so glad. I'm so glad Jesus did it his way because now I have life. I have a future. I have a hope. I was on the outside looking in that didn't have anything, any direction, any purpose, anything in this life. But then he turned everything around because 2,000 years ago he had another plan. It might look like a Friday night in your life. It might look like it's destitute and, and the darkness has come in. But I want to promise you, the answer is on the way. Sunday is on the way. The resurrection power will come and take care of everything that you thought was destitute and destroyed in your life. And he will answer. I said, he will answer. Give to you what you need in a moment. When failures and disappointments build up in our life, The hope is deferred. There's a number of reasons why you are unable to put your trust, unable to put your hope in Jesus. Is because when you have been disappointed, when the failure has come, usually what happens, the first thing that happens is you shut down and shut up. You shut up your heart. You're no longer open. You're no longer willing to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you because you've been disappointed or disappointed in others, disappointed in a circumstance, disappointed in a situation. You shut down and you shut up. And that brings you to the next place is where you withdraw. You, you're withdrawn and, and you become guarded. Have you ever been there? Ever, ever placed this steel cage around yourself and said, I'm, I, don't, I don't want to be hurt again? I don't want to be disappointed again. So it's easier for me not to hope, not to trust, not to believe. And just leave myself in this situation, this circumstance, because I don't want to be hurt again. But if you find yourself there, then you become calloused and hardened. And this is a very dangerous place for your heart to be. It's calloused and hardened. If you have a hard heart, it's not just, I'm, I'm, I don't want to be hurt again. It's, it's not in those arenas. And you're thinking, well, I'm, I'm just, it's self-preservation. It's, it's something I need to do right now. But the problem is, is when you become calloused and hardened, the Holy Spirit no longer can move upon you and soften and, and bring the strength and bring the provision because you have everything at arm's length. And the next step that happens as you become angry and bitter. Without hope, there is no future. Without hope, your life becomes just a shell. 
just a shadow of what God wants it to be. But I got some good news. I got some good news. I'll give you some hope. I'll give you some help through the word. He said in Psalm chapter 39, David said this, Psalm 39, verse 7, he says, Now, Lord, what do I wait for? My hope is is in you. If you read that chapter 39, you can see that David's going through a desperate, difficult time. He's surrounded by enemies and he's crying out. I am, and he's having such an overwhelming discouragement that's taking place. And he makes this statement in the middle of all that. He said, what do I wait for now? I wait for you and my hope is found in you. First thing that you need to do is recognize that God will always keep His Word. Remind yourself of that. So if I said, God is going to keep His Word. He has never lied. He has never held back. He has always done what He said He's going to do. God will always follow through on His promises. It's not necessarily when you want or how you want, it is in the provision of the calendar and the timing of heaven. God will do always what he said he's going to do, and he'll bring that help to you. Do you believe that this morning? Let yourself believe that. Let yourself rest in that provision. Church, you can safely trust in your God. You can safely trust in him. And I want you to think about it. You might be saying, well, you know, I was disappointed. I was hurt. It wasn't God that hurt you. It wasn't God that failed you. It was man. It was your own thoughts and your own ideals. You know, God's calendar is so important. How many of you realize this is not the end game? This world is not our home. You're a pilgrim passing through. Turn to your neighbor and say, hey, pilgrim. You're not here but for a season. You know what James calls you? A vapor. This is what James says about your life. The extent of your life. 70, 80 years on the planet. If you're blessed, he said you are but a... That's it. That's what you is. Turn to your neighbor. Let him know. I don't spit. That's it. That's it. So if that is all this world is, and eternity is what we're looking for and what we're longing for, come on now. Now, Some of you all stuck on the the, the anxiety part about what we started with, anxiety, I need more hope. Come on, fast forward with me just a little bit. This is so much more. So much more. Because if this is all there is, we've been ripped off. If this is it, You know what eternal life with Jesus is going to be? You know the phenomenal blessing that you're going to receive every day? No more sickness, no more pain. No more death, no more dying. No more disease. Ah. No more struggle, no more sin. There's going to be joy unspeakable. There's going to be provision. There's going to be help. Come on. You're going to be reunited with loved ones that have gone on before. How many are longing for that day? How many say, even so, come quickly? Come quickly, Lord. Come quickly. How many of you would be okay if he took up a load right now? There you go. So if the, if the end game is eternal life with Jesus, then all the rest of this, it's easy to put it in perspective and say, I should not be concerned. This should not be a situation that is overwhelming me. I should not be in this place of anxiety or fear because God's got this in eternity. I promise you two seconds after you leave this planet and are ushered into the presence of the living God, none of this is going to matter to you. Everything that you're worried about, everything that has overwhelmed you, it's not going to matter. 
and in the presence of the king, everything is made right. Second thing that you would do that would bring so much help is allow your heart, listen to me, allow your heart to hope again. That same place that is withdrawn and guarded, same place that is calloused and hardened, this is something that you must do. You've got to open the door. You shut the door, open the door. Oftentimes I begin to minister to this a very specific thing to people that are hurt, people that are guarded, and they always reply many times. They'll say, I don't know if I can. There is so much fear. If I open the door, the flood of emotions that will overwhelm me, I almost broke down. I almost shut down mentally, emotionally, and I don't know if I can handle that. The Lord knows exactly not only what you need, what you can handle, and what you can't. He will. He will intervene for you, and he will carry you. He'll minister to you. I'll, I'm asking you to don't open. I'm not asking you to open your heart to me or to a church or to anyone else. I'm asking you to open your heart to Jesus and to trust again. Trust in his provision. Trust in his direction. Trust in his anointings. Trust in his giftings. Trust in his purpose for your life. Begin to trust him again. If you will, this morning say, I will. I'll do that, Jesus. And, I, and I say, well, it's, it's so simple. Just begin to open the door. I'm not asking you to try to change anything that has taken place or, or try to do anything more than just open the door. Open the door. Allow your heart to hope again. The third thing is, is let the Holy Spirit begin to heal the hurt. I'm going to say that again. Let the Holy Spirit heal the hurt and soften the hardness. Before the hardness can be softened, the hurt must be healed. That area that you were disappointed, that you were discouraged, that you were hurt, the Holy Spirit will bring in that healing provision to wash over you and give you the ability to receive the joy and the peace, the trust. And that is something that you have to do. You have to allow that to happen. Jesus is not going to kick down the door and say, this is what you're going to do. But he stands at the door and he knocks. And if you open the door, he comes in. That's his word. That's his promise. I know the hurt for many is deep. And understandably so. Those of you that loved great, the pain is great. Those of you that move with great anointing and passion, I know that. I understand that. But what I will say to you, there is one that is already not only full aware, but he's been under that weight. and He's been carrying you. Now, how long will the process take? For some, it's a quick turnaround. For some, it's a while. There's no set provision on time-wise what God does in your life. But I'll tell you this, give you some insight here, is that he will guide and direct you and he will walk with you what you can do, and what you can't do. And, and he will take care of every circumstance, situation. All you have to do is say, okay, Lord, come in. I need your help. It begins to bring that encouragement. Let me ask you this question. Got another scripture and we're about done. And Amen. <laughs> I ask you this question. Can you trust the one that loves you to no end? Can you trust the one that laid down his life for you? 
Can you trust the one that took your place? That took your sin? That took your faults and your failures? And gave you life? Gave you hope? Gave you joy? He gave you beauty for ashes. He gave you joy for your mourning. Can you trust him? Can you trust him? One that's done everything. With that in mind, just take the first step and say, okay, Jesus. And, and here's, here's what the enemy will do. Here's what Satan will do. He will, right on the heels, I, I, I can hear him messing with some of you, speaking to you, saying, you can't go back. You can't go back to that ministry. You can't go back to that provision. You can't go back to that situation. Because, you know, it's, the Lord never returns to the old. He makes all things new. He builds on the foundations that he placed. But what he has for you ahead is so much greater and better what you had in the past. What he's going to do now, what he's going to do tomorrow, is overwhelmingly blessed. I don't want to miss it. I don't want to be dragging the old, dead past. I'm going to let it go with an open hand so I can receive what he has for me now. And to do that, i got to trust him. My hope has got to be found and forged in him if I'm going to move forward. And so today, you tell the enemy, shut up. Yesterday's gone. Come on. Yesterday's gone. What I have is something brand new today. Life happens today. In Isaiah chapter 43, verse 1, Isaiah 43, verse 1 says, Now said the Lord who created you, O Jacob, who formed you, o Israel, fear not, I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the water, I'll be with you. Through the rivers, they'll not overflow you. When, someone say when. I, I, I like this. This is God speaking to you. Okay, you're part of his family. You're adopted. Come on. Is he speaking to you? This is a scripture that you right between the running lights receive it. He said, look at it. He said, if, right? If you go through. No. No, I, I missed that. He said, maybe you'll go through. Mm, no. It's pretty definitive. He said, When? When you go through. David said many of the afflictions of the righteous, but God delivers us out of them all. He said, even though I go through the valley of the shadow, you're with me. He's with you. I don't see anywhere in the word of God that he promised that once you give your life to Jesus, that everything is going to be just perfect and everything's going to be rainbows and butterflies. But what he did say is that when you have issues, when you have trouble, I'm with you. I'm with you always. I'll never leave you or forsake you. And if we have this concept and this mentality that we're going to find nirvana here on this earth, that we're going to have the blessed peace continually and constantly, and there's not going to be any issues, probably you're going to be sorely disappointed because that is what we have in the world and the life to come. In eternal life with Jesus Christ, that is what's to come. At this moment, we are the light that shines in dark places. And the light can only shine if you are able to shine that light. And I want to be the brightest light I can be. So Jesus, prepare me. Give me that ability. And when I go through the rivers, I will not be overwhelmed. And when I go through the fire... I will not be burned. Come on. I'll go through the flood. 